Hello, and welcome to Theme Thursday here on Answer Everywhere. Today, we are starting a new theme, which is Language Server Protocol, or LSP implementations, tools, those sorts of things. Today, we're taking a look at the uh, Rust LSP server, which is part of Rust Analyzer. I don't think we're going to look at the whole Rust Analyzer code, but we may have to jump into uh, individual bits here and there. Before I begin, um, I have a couple of administrative things that I wanted to mention. Hang on. All right. Um, so one is that, uh, I don't know the last time I did this, but uh, my channel has been growing uh, way quicker than I imagined it would. Um, we're now at uh, 4.84 thousand subscribers, uh, close to 5,000. I think last time I mentioned it, we were maybe at like uh, one or 2,000 or maybe, maybe even in the hundreds. So I wanted to take the time and thank everyone who subscribed and welcome new subscribers and uh, I really appreciate all of your comments and all of your um, all of the love, all the feedback uh, that uh, that's that really helps this thing uh, keep going. And um, among other things, I have I have collected a ton of requests for uh, for source code repositories people would like me to take a look at. So I've I've compiled a list, and I've been thinking about how to kind of go through the list. Um, and right now, uh, my thinking is that on uh, Fan Request Fridays, what we're going to do is something I'm calling Fan Request Roulette, which is where I will have a, uh, a uh, the list of all the requests. There might be some kind of priority ranking, um, including things like, uh, you know, what have we seen before? Which things have preconditions that it would be nice to see? Which things seem to have broad appeal, etc. And then we're going to uh, somehow randomly choose one. We'll like roll a D20 or we'll spin a wheel or, or something along those lines. And we'll pick one live and then jump into the source code. So I think that'll be a fun way to um, to make sure that we're visiting the fan requests um, without having to worry too much about optimizing this schedule um, manually ahead of time. So thank you. Uh, uh, this has been an, an amazing experience so far and um, we're going to keep going and explore more uh, more source code repositories. And uh, with that in mind, I um, I spent a little time putting together a schedule. Um, next week on Meme Gen Monday, we're going to look at Flutter. This is kind of an echo of the, uh, the uh, show we did on React. And uh, on Tools Tuesday, we're going to look at Bugzilla, which is kind of an older uh, program. Uh, but an important one. And this will be the, the first uh, bug tracking software that we take a look at. On Network Wednesday next week, we'll be looking at eBPF, which is kind of the new hotness in terms of kernel uh, networking. It lets you uh, kind of push sandboxed pro uh, programs from user space into the kernel to kind of extend what the kernel is able to do with networking. On Theme, th on theme Thursday, we'll continue the um, LSP theme. And, and also continue the, the kind of ongoing thread through the show of, of looking at Haskell. And we'll take a look at Haskell Language Server. Um, and then on Friday, that'll be our first fan request roulette. Um, and then the following week, there's kind of an, uh, an undercurrent or, or secondary theme of uh, starting to look more at what's going on in the cloud. On Meme Gen Monday, we'll look at Kubernetes. Uh, and then on Tools Tuesday, we'll look at Envoy Proxy, which is a uh, a proxy that that's served as a part of a, a few different kind of like service mesh type uh, type projects. On Network Wednesday, we'll look at Cilium, which is a uh, Kubernetes networking plugin that that's based on eBPF. Um, and then on Theme Thursday, we'll look at Source Graph, which is a project to make a um, a source code exploration code search uh, a web interface uh, based on LSP. And then on Fun Friday, uh, we'll take a look at Quake, the uh, classic uh, first-person shooter video game. Um, so those should all be fun, and I hope to see uh, many of you there.
And with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at Rust. Oh, actually, uh, one more piece of um, administrative, whatchamacallit. Uh, for a while, I was trying to, and by for a while, I mean for two days, I was trying to leave up the live streams instead of reposting afterwards. Um, I'm glad I tried it. Uh, I've realized, though, that uh, YouTube, the the tooling for, li for live streams that are turned into VODs or, or that are left up or whatever you want to call it, is not as good as the tooling for um, regular video uploads. I think YouTube kind of assumes that um, live streams are mostly things like people, you know, hanging out and playing games for for five hours, and so uh, the uh, the the all the processing that that YouTube does behind the scenes uh, ha seems to heavily deprioritize uh, live streams that have that have finished streaming, and so for that reason. Uh, when I when I finish a stream, it's I have to wait at least like 24 hours before I do even minor edits, and even minor edits will uh, delete the chat replay, which was one of the main reasons that I wanted to leave these up. So going forward, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, continue to upload um, the the higher resolution versions. That way, you'll get um, a nicer, cleaner version at higher resolution sooner. And I'm going to automatically unlist the live streams as soon as they're done. That way, if you, you know, are interested in the live stream, you can grab the link and you can and you can watch it before the uh, the video is, is reposted if you want to. But you can also just wait until until it gets reposted. So um, those of you who watched the the Git uh, uh, live stream vod or the IP tables live stream VOD, you may see a second uh, notification as I'm publishing the um, the uploaded version. So I apologize for that, um, but there I feel like there are not a lot of great choices, and this is the one that I think is is best for for everyone in the long run. So so we'll just continue uh, with with that strategy. Okay, so here we are in um, in Rust Analyzer uh, slash lib slash LSP server. I believe LSP server was started as a as a separate project and got kind of merged into Rust Analyzer, or at least this is the descendant of previous attempts to make an LSP server. Um, and we don't have a lot of directories in the LSP server directory. We have the the source and the examples and the cargo. And uh, maybe I'll take a quick look at cargo. It's probably worth looking at some examples and uh, looking at the source. Um, I, uh, I don't really read Rust. I've written a little bit of Rust, um, but I would imagine that most of the interesting bits of syntax are going to be unfamiliar to me. So if you're, if you happen to be watching the stream and you're a Rust person, um, feel free to chime in and let me know if I'm, uh, if I'm misunderstanding something, but, um, you know, I'm not going to let something like that stop me from, uh, from poking around. All right, so in the cargo we have uh, we have just this package declaration, I guess. This is just telling us that this is the package that we we have, which is LSP server, um, and we get license information, and we have a pointer to the repository. And the dependencies are not many. We just have log, and sert or sert and crossbeam channel. I don't know what any of these things are, but JSON seems <laughs> like JSON. Um, cert, I don't know, and cross beam channel, maybe something related to channels, maybe um, something similar to to coroutines or um, messaging between threads. And then we have a dependency on LSP types, which is a dev dependency. And uh, I don't know if this is a separate project. This might be a separate project that just has the types from the LSP protocol. I'm not sure. Um, Here's some examples with go to def. So in go to def, we have a minimal example, a minimal example LSP server that can only respond to the go to definition request. To use this example, execute it and then send an initialized request. So executing it, I guess, is going to start some server. And initialize is kind of like a request or, or maybe an RPC. And this will respond. Okay, so is this an example of a request? 
So this looks like um, something you can just use do with curl. So you send some JSON RPC 2.0. I guess this is telling it what version of JSON RPC that the client is speaking, maybe. The method is initialize. The ID is one and params are capabilities. So this uh, this is RPC. You can kind of see that this is uh, much more, more ver verbose than the um, than like the wire format of, of protocol buffers. But that's the uh, that's the you know that's the kind of trade off uh, with using something that has um, like an interface description language uh, versus something uh, more like JRPC, JSON RPC, which um, kind of makes you uh, describe more about what's going on in the in the request itself. Uh, and then we get a server response, and we it tells us the JSON RPC version and the method initialized, and I guess empty params, which will send, which will have no response, but this does seem like a response. Maybe it means the response is empty. And then once these two are sent, we'll enter the main loop of the server. The only request this example can handle is go to definition. So initialize is just going to say like start, start doing things, and that initialize enters the main loop. And then um, we can send it a go to definition request, which uh, has this kind of namespace thing, text to document definition. It doesn't say go to definition. I'm just, I guess it's just going to uh, return us the, the definition. And um, ID2, I'm not, I still don't know what ID is, but the parameters are uh, we have some text document um, field which is set to, I guess, a URI of file temp and position line character one. So in order, in order to tell it what definition to go to, um, we're telling it what line the definition is on and what character it starts with. And I guess it's the LSP server's job to know uh, what the, we're not telling it the end character. So maybe just by inference, um, the LSP server is going to know enough. It's just going to use its knowledge of, of how to parse Rust and figure out where that symbol's end is. And then um, to finish out without errors, we just send a, a shutdown message. Three. I don't know if ID, maybe the ID is just the, um, it's just a counter of, of which request, how many requests you've sent. Um, and you send it uh, shut down, takes no parameters, and then the server is going to exit the main loop. Okay. So here's the main function. Let's just see what, how many functions we have. Um, we've got main, we've got main loop, and we've got cast. So cast, um, let's see. I think, I think, I think the syntax is cast is like maybe templated by type R. But it's going to take a request of type request, I think, and return a result of uh, of type, I guess, like um, a tuple of request ID and params as the no. Okay, so this is the tuple. Oops, you're gonna let me just highlight this. Yeah, so this is the tuple. So the result has like two parameters. One is this this tuple of the request ID and the params, I guess, that were, that were passed into it. And then um, the second element of result is uh, something about extracting errors from the request. Um, and this where clause, I'm not sure how to read the where clause. Maybe we'll look up what, a, what a, the where clause syntax is. But essentially, we're just calling request extract our method. Let's look at um, the Rust where clause. When specifying generic types and bounds separately, it is clearer. Clearer than what? Um, so we have impl a trait b plus trait c. I don't know if that is this like a sum type. D is trait A plus trait F. My trait, uh, I guess, depending on A and D. 
and for your type, pressing bounds with a where clause. So, so I guess a where clause is going to give us some sort of bounds. So impl ad, my trait ad for your type where, a, I guess is, this is like a condition on, on a. Um, it's either maybe either a trait B or a trait C or a trait E or a trait F. Perhaps? Let's look at traits. Okay, traits can be generic. Hmm. Maybe a type? What if we just look up Rust sum types? AKA tagged unions. Yeah, this is stuff about enums. That's stuff about options. I don't think enums or options are some types. Yeah, let me see if I can find something that gets more to the point. Does Rust have real sum types? I want to express the limit set of type for an associated type in one of my traits, but I got stuck. Type A, type inner, trait example, type associated, blah, blah, blah. The Haskell type AB equals A, B, or C is written in Rust like enum A of B, A depending on B, and C. Okay. All right, so, so I guess in Haskell, um, some types are kind of tied into enums in some way. I mean, I mean in, in Rust. So let me see if I can... Maybe it's a trait thing. The plus sign allows you to combine multiple requirements in a trait bound. Okay, so the, it's calling these things trait bounds. So one type trait, uh, two trait plus three trait means that the one type associated type, the one type associated type must implement both two trait and three trait traits. Okay, so it's not, um, it's not a sum, it's kind of more like an and. So, uh, so this tells us that R is essentially a request. And this tells us something about a surge deserialized owned. The params are like a deserialized, I guess, JavaScript thing. At least that's how I'm going to interpret it. Um, so here's the main function. The main is going to take nothing and maybe return a result. Something about errors plus sync plus send. Note that we must have our logging only write out to standard error, standard error. So, okay, so we're going to write the standard error. Um, create the transport includes the, uh, the standard IO versions, but this could also be implemented using sockets or HTTP. So connection, where's connection coming from? It's from, I guess it's an LSP server thing. So we're going to create some sort of standard IO uh, pipey thing and give it and return a handle and some stuff about threads. And this CERD JSON library, let me just make sure that CERD is not something more uh, fundamental than just like JSON stuff. CERD is a framework for serializing and deserializing Rust data structures efficiently and generic. Generically. So they know there are things that know how to serialize and deserialize themselves. Okay, so um, we're going to give this server capabilities thingy. This looks like some sort of object. Um, it's going to take a definition uh, definition provider sum one of left true uh, sum one of left seems like it's just uh, fiddling around to get the right type. And really, the definition provider seems to be like set to true. So I'm not sure um, what that means. But and then we've got this, whatever this default argument is. And then we're going to unwrap it. Maybe that's a call to the third thing. Um, and then we're going to initialize the, the connection with whatever server capabilities is. 
Run the server and wait for the two threads to end, typically by trigger LSP exit event. So this doesn't seem to just be, I think this is just getting the, the capabilities. And this is initializing the connection. Maybe that's running the server. And then uh, it's going to return, I guess, initialization parameters. And then we're going to call main loop on the connection and the initialization parameters. And then uh, eventually we're going to call thread join. I guess when the main loop exits, we're going to join the threads and then we're going to shut down and call OK. And the main loop is going to take a connection, the parameters, and it's going to iterate over. Uh, so the, the connection has some sort of receiver, which is presumably going to be under the hood, kind of like a queue. And so as we, which I'm going to think of as a queue, may not literally be. But uh, so it's going to have some message queue. And then we're going to iterate over messages. And I guess that somehow we know, um, I don't know what happens if you don't have a message to iterate over. I guess it just somehow waits. Um, and then we're going to match the message, I guess, probably to find a handler. Um, and we're going to look at the request. And if it's handle shut down, we're going to return OK, which I guess means just like success, <laughs> exit successfully. Um, what does this return? This returns a result box dine error plus sync plus send. Okay. So um, I guess okay is maybe a little bit like an error message, a successful um, status condition. Um, we've got some ePrint line. This is a macro. I don't know what e, how ePrint line is different from other print line things, but we're just going to essentially log. And then if we're not... Uh, Yeah, so where are we? So this is where we checked if it was shut down, right? So I think this is now looking to see if it's another type of request. Um, and we're gonna try to cast the request to go to definition, I suppose. And um, if that's okay, then maybe I think we somehow get IDs and parameters. Um, and we're going to log that we got to go to definition request. And then we're going to return a sum, go to definition response. I'm going to assume sum is a little bit like maybe or uh, or, or just, or it, it's essentially this is some optional type. And we're saying that we have, that we're, we are um, choosing the option where it's actually populated. Um, and the result is going to essentially be a go to definition response with an empty array, it looks like. And then uh, we're gonna do some json -y stuff. We're gonna take the result, unwrap it, and send a response. Uh, or, or rather create the response and then send it. And then continue, I guess, going back to the beginning of the for loop. Um, Otherwise, we're gonna we don't recognize the go to definition or the request or the um, stop or whatever shutdown request. So we're just going to to bail out by calling panic. And then if we get a response, we're just gonna print out the response. If we get a notification, I guess we'll just print out the notification. All right. So most of that makes sense. I don't. Um, where did we actually go to a definition? Seems like we created a, an empty result and then uh, deserialized it. So maybe. Um, where's the res where's the response example? Yeah, I guess it, it seems like the, the server basically sends it, uh, a non-informative response. Um, and then I had some other thing I wanted to look at, which was, where is initialized called? We're getting the server capabilities and we're calling initialize. But it doesn't seem to wait for the initialization request, does it?
I'm not sure. Maybe there's something implicit that 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 listens for the initialized request, or maybe the the documentation has gotten out of sync with the example in some way. But we're not going to dig into that too much. Here is uh, here's the source. This is the only other file, and we don't have a lot here. We have sockets, which we might as well look at since we've looked at sockets before. We have messages, um, a request queue. That's probably the queue that I, that I was mentioning. Standard I/O which uh, we saw in the example um, seems to do some of the work of actually setting up the, the connection. And we have lib and error, which I guess we're going to ignore an error. So I'm guessing that since there's so little here um, that uh, this may depend in a crucial way on some of the, um, some of the other stuff in Rust Analyzer. So uh, we'll take a look. I mean, we may have to look elsewhere in this, in this repo. Okay, here's socket. Since I'm not familiar with Rust, uh, let's see. If, let's try to do the easiest stuff first. Maybe, maybe let's take a look at standard I/O. I don't know if that's actually easier. This looks relatively small. So we've got this crossbeam channel thing. Let's look up Rust crossbeam. Tools for concurrent programming. Yeah, something about concurrent programming. It's channel-y stuff. So we're gonna get some sort of channel that is, I guess, bounded. I don't know, I don't know if the channel is bounded or if the type is bounded. We've got a receiver and a sender. We're gonna use the crate message. I'm not sure what message is, but something related to messages. So we're going to create an LSP connection via standard IO. And the standard IO transport thingy is going to return a sender of message, a receiver of message, and some IO threads. We create a bounded message queue, uh, I guess, of zero length or zero size initially, or maybe just means it's empty. Um, and then the writer is going to be, we're going to spawn a thread. I don't know what this or sign is. Move. Maybe this is kind of like uh, we're moving. Um, move is this like moving ownership. I'm not sure. I'll look this up in a second. Okay. But then we've got the standard out. Uh, and then I guess we're going to get a lock for standard out, which is, I guess, mutable unless that means mutex. And um, we're gonna take the writer receiver, which we got from created the bounding bounded queue, and we're going to turn it into an iterator, I guess, and, and try for each thingy, we're gonna write to the standard out, to the mutable standard out, and we're gonna call okay. So this is a little bit, um, so standard out being mutable means, I guess, that we can change it at runtime. So we're going to try to write to it for everything for writer receiver. This is, I guess this is a queue that's going to read stuff that, that you're going to, it's going to receive stuff and then write what it receives. Maybe. Let's see what else is going on. We've, we've got these reader, sender, reader, receiver. Uh, these are also bounded. And then the reader, we're going to, again, spawn a thread called this move thing, um, get standard in and a, uh, mutable reference to it. And since we're the reader, we're going to, I guess, wait for messages. And we're going to, uh, when we get at some message, we're going to read from standard in. And I don't know what question mark means, but it might mean uh, this is either successful or uh, or not null. That those are both common um, common meanings for the question mark in different languages. I'm going to guess this means that this was successful. 
in which case uh, we're going to, I guess, check if it matches his exit. Uh, I guess we're going to check to see if it match, matches some um, exit notification. And if so, we're going to set is exit. Uh, or rather, we're going to set is exit to the value of whether it matches. And then we're going to send reader sender message unwrap. Maybe this means that uh, we're going to send it to, I don't know who we're sending it to, but maybe people who have subscribed to this queue, assuming this this, this is pubs up. Hey, James, let's go. <laughs> James, do you know Rust? Let me pop, let me pop this, uh, this over here, this chat. Finally, <laughs> Hey, hi, this bird has been charged. I laugh every time I see this name. I don't know where <laughs> this is from, the bird thing. All right, so, um, okay. So we're doing some queue stuff, which uh, seems like um, standard queue stuff. Again, uh, the syntax I'm not so familiar with. There's a bunch of stuff that I think is probably, um, different from other languages, uh, mostly because the it's got a cool type system. And so not really knowing the, the type system well or the decisions they made about how to think about it. Um, I'm really black, black, black boxing a lot of stuff um, and trying to get what I can rather than trying to get 100% um, accuracy. Um, so if you're, if you're watching this as a Rust person, um, I'm sure that I'm missing a ton of, a ton of important stuff. But... Um, we're just gonna we're just gonna plow ahead and see what we can figure out, and then uh, the, this thread things we're gonna have uh, I/O threads of reader and writer, um, and then this is the last line. So I guess maybe conventionally this is a return statement. So uh, we're gonna return the writer sender, the reader receiver, and threads. And we saw in the example actually let's pull up the example again. We saw in the example what was done with those things. The print line. Okay, ePrint line is, uh, thank you, um, Abhishek. ePrint line is standard error. I guess the E stands for error. Uh, so somewhere we have standard IO in this. Um... Yeah, so here, here we're calling connection standard IO. But we get connection and IO thread. So maybe this is different because we only have one return value here, right? But in standard IO, we have three. I don't know if Rust is uh, taking these first two things and assigning them to connection. What does connection take? Connection takes a connection. Or maybe connection standard IO wraps whatever this standard IO thing is. I'm not sure. We've got this thing for make IO threads, which has, I guess, join handles. These are things that you, I guess you can use to, to, to join the threads. And these are the reader and writer threads. And then the public struct IO threads. Okay, so IO threads is, is its own thing. I thought maybe this was a library. But we've got the reader, which is a thread, with a join handle, and I guess it has some sort of result, IO result. And the writer is it's the same thing. And then impl IO threads. Oh, this is pub crate. Does this create a crate? I'm not sure. Impl IO threads. Um, is this telling us that like, I'm not sure. It's presumably some sort of implementation. I'll look up impl soon. Um, but we've got, well, what can we do? This seems like stuff we can do with threads. We can join them. And we have this match self reader join thing and the writer join thing, and they can do OK or error. Cool. So Abhishek says you have arguments in between or sign for lambda, kind of like parentheses. Let me expand this. Question mark is basically get value. OK, get value or return. Uh, so like get or fail um, is how, thank you, Ab. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name right. If I'm not, please let me know. Thank you, Abhishek. This is, um, this is super, <laughs> super useful. So, so question mark is like get or fail. 
which is a common pattern. You sometimes see that, you know, like in C++ and macros or whatever. Um, and then the arguments between the or sign for lambda. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that I think I figured that out here. I think this is like binding the it thing um, as a lambda. But what I don't know is this. So maybe this is an, oh, maybe this is um, a lambda with no arguments. Your chat window is bugged. Yeah, there's a delay. I'm not sure how long it is. It might be like a minute. Um, I haven't explicitly set it, so it's whatever uh, YouTube thinks is the is the default delay. Um, so I'm going to guess that uh, based on on what I was just told about lambdas, I'm going to guess that this is an empty lambda, a lambda that takes no argu arguments. That move is kind of like the standard move thing in C++ that that transfers ownership. Let's see if you can look up Rust move. Move. And there's a Rust movie. I doubt it's about this, the programming language. Okay, so pub crate means it's visible inside this crate. So it's like a visibility uh, modifier. Thank you. Uh, push QRDX. Push QRDX. Cool, thanks. That's <laughs> this is super helpful. <laughs> All right, so move to okay. We can, we can capture a closures environment by value. Move converts any variables captured by reference or immutable reference to variables captured by value. So for example, let data be this vector one two three, then let closure equals move uh, print line some stuff. Data is no longer available. It is owned by the closure. Note move may still implement function or function mute, fn or fn mute, mut, even though they capture variables by move. This is because the traits implemented by a closure type are determined by what the closure does with the captured values, not how it captures them. Okay, this is, uh, I think this is what I was asking. And uh, move captures a closure's environment by value. So data is no longer available in this example. It's owned by the closure. And this is the closure, I guess, on the left-hand side. Uh, I see. So here's data. We created this vector, and then we're going to print it. And move is saying, um, I guess this is somehow passing in. Um, this, is a this is a macro. So this is somehow passing in the value to the print function that's created by the macro, I assume, under the hood. And then um, and then uh, the move here is somehow telling it to take ownership, telling this thing, this, this, this lambda, that, to take ownership of the essentially the pointer that, that we passed in that, that this is this vector. Impl block is where, uh, so Abhishek says impl block. Oh, I missed a couple of things. Impl is pretty much. Um, adding methods to a struct. It's like putting the method. How can I avoid resizing this repeatedly? Maybe I just need it to be wider and stay wider. Uh, it's like putting the methods inside the struct in C++, but Rust puts them in the input blocks. Okay. So it's adding methods to a struct. Okay. So it's not, um, I was thinking it was maybe a little bit like uh, Go, uh, the way that Go handles um whatever they call it uh when you have a when you have some sort of interface and an implementation um but uh, uh push qrdx is saying that uh it's basically extending the struct by functionality which is which makes a lot of sense and the input block is where you define member functions okay great thank you uh thank you both but since this is wide i guess i'm going to make it wide and be where on the top How about the top not uh, maybe the bottom somewhere. I don't know. I think I have to. I think I have to make it smaller. I'll just have to keep figuring out a way to resize it. Is there an easy way to grab it? Whatever. Okay. So um, you know, I, I can't just whatever. There we go. All right. Um. So that that's standard I/O. Okay, so I'm getting I'm getting a, a feeling I guess for Rust now. 
um, with all the help from the chat. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, push QRDX says that um, this thing that looks like an or sign is just a lambda with no arguments. Cool. Um, all right. So here's lib.rs. Is that what we want next? Maybe we want message in the spirit of trying to do things that seem like they might be simpler. Message is pretty long. What is lib? Lib is pretty long, but not too long. Here's socket. Socket is short. And then this is request. So I'm guessing all of the type definition stuff is really in Rust Analyzer. And this is just server, server logic. So let's see if this is true. Let's look at socket. We've got this cross beam channel again. Um, we're going to make some IO threads. And we have this function socket transport. I feel like I'm missing something that, that's not scrolling here. What's going on, OBS? I feel like I can see a hint of text here. OK, so I, in another window, I have better access to the chat, but I would like this to work. I think this is what happened with um, with my other my other video where I missed a bunch of the chat. I can tell OBS is just not displaying stuff. I don't know for whatever reason OBS won't let me see the whole chat, but that's uh, uh, I guess that's that. Um, so I, I see that that push QRDX says in Rust um, you don't actually need to explicitly specify what a lambda captures. This is equivalent to just capturing all the data, okay, um, in C++. But it, but in in Rust, data is implicitly captured if it's used. Okay, so I guess um, I guess Rust detects whether uh, whether data is used, and if so, it, it's considered captured, even if um, even if you uh, if even if you don't explicitly say it. Cool. All right. Um, so here's socket. What do we do in socket? We've got socket transport. We can make a reader and we can make write. Why a write and not a reader? Not a, a writer? I don't know. But um, so pub create socket transport. So this is, I guess, a visi visibility, public visibility within the crate is what I think is, is going on. I think what somebody told me. Um, and to create a, a socket transport, we've got this TCP stream thing. And we're going to return a sender message and receiver message and IO threads. And this is all just threading stuff. Um, and similarly, we can make this receiver, receiver thingamajiggy. And what do we do? I think we're just, it's just a queue. We've got a buff reader, new stream, while some, well, we have some message, I guess. Uh, we're going to read uh, from the mutable buffer read thing and unwrap it and check if it's exit. So we're special casing exit here, I guess, and elsewhere. And um, if it's exit, we'll stop. And maybe uh, maybe exit is like a, um, a control plane stuff as opposed to data plane stuff. So maybe the data plane stuff is like the JSON RPC and exit is more like um, close the uh, close the reader or writer queue or something um, at any rate when we uh, when we have some message we're going to call oops call reader send on it and then we have this make write thing which is more or less the same except we're everything is flipped we're like in the opposite category everything that's a receiver becomes a sender and uh, it seems like this should probably be make writer because we get writer sender, but it's make write. I think that, that might be just like a typo. I don't know. Um, or maybe there's some reason you can't call it make writer. Uh, and then it's basically doing the same stuff, but I guess it's going to receive some, it's going to receive some things. And for each, it's going to write it to whatever the stream is. So this is, uh, so where do we use sockets? TCP stream, which we're getting from net TCP stream. So this is essentially the same thing as uh, as the standard I/O file, I think, except it's doing it with uh, TCP 
streams instead of IO streams. Um, man, I really wish I could see what's here. Can I pop? I don't think I can just pop this part out of YouTube. Maybe try to pop up the chat window from the YouTube video and make it always on top. I can click the window title bar. This is actually not an XFCE window, unfortunately. I think this is like a, um, a GNOME window. I could try to take the... I don't think I can pop up the chat from YouTube, can I? Oh, I can. Hey. Look at that. Oh, that that's probably much better. So let me do this. Um, let me do this logged in. Let me open this in a. Another container here. Can I make this always be on top? Yeah. All right. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Yes, thank you, push QRDX. I had no idea that I could um, pop this out. And how do I, is there a way to get rid of this learn more thing? I already clicked here. Let me try just clicking on learn more. What if I just say hi? All right, well, for whatever reason, this learn more thing is gonna be here perpetually until I guess it scrolls up. All right, thank you for, for everyone. Yeah, awesome. Oh, this is so much better. And I can actually grab the corner. So cool. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> this is life changing. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so okay, so that was socket. Here's message. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that uh message is just going to handle messages. So we'll take a quick look at it. Um, but I don't think this is really telling us much about um, like the under, you know, how how this understands the type systems, or 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 anything like that. Um, okay, so we have must we've got this buffer read buffer write stuff, deserialized owned. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You think I can refresh the window and it won't show it again? I'll try it. I'll try it off screen just in case it, um, when I refresh it, something insane happens. Can I refresh a pop-up? I don't think I, um, I don't, I don't think I have a way of refreshing it. It'll just scroll, it'll just scroll past the, um, the, whatever this view box is eventually, I think. Okay, so this is actually like, a, this is a, um, what we're basically doing is we're building an RPC service, but we're not, um, we're, we're kind of building it from scratch by creating channels and, and whatnot. Whereas like in something like, I think something like protocol buffers or gRPC, all of that stuff would be handled by the, by the framework. But um, the LSP protocol presumably defines it as a protocol that uses JSON RPC. So when you implement a server, you have to have kind of this, this JSON RPC handily stuff. So you can get a message. Okay, so from request for message. So a message has a request, a response, and a notification. Notification might be kind of like st status or metadata. Um, and we can get a message from a request, I guess, and get a message from a response. And um, similarly from notification. We have a request ID, which derives a bunch of stuff. Oops, derives a bunch of stuff. And uh, I guess this is support for Sered. So I can kind of see, as people are telling me more about how Rust, how Rust looks, I can kind of see the corresponding things from the Haskell world. So that, that's, I think, helping to orient me a bit. Um, and then we have this ID representation, which is probably int32 or a string. So I guess you can either send a 32-bit int or a string. I'll spam it away. <laughs> yeah, spam away. Thank you. 
All right. Um, and then we can, we can, you know, these are basically casting, um, from various things. So I can, if I have an N32, I can make it a request and, and probably vice versa. Um, this is how to display a request ID, but not a request, I think. And, uh, Here's the request struct, which I guess we hadn't defined yet, which has an ID, a method, some stuff about SIRD, JSON serialization, and a, uh, a parameters, which is a, just a JSON value. I guess you can just set parameters to any valid JSON or something. I don't know if that's true. And then similarly for response, yeah, we're really just building up like uh, RPC, RPC stuff. And then error codes, these are defined by JSON RPC. We got parse error, yeah, invalid request, method not found, invalid params, internal server error star, this standard uh, error stuff, request canceled. And these are all negative numbers. Content modified, okay. And then we have a notification. And the message, these, I guess, impl message means that these are the uh, behaviors that a message can have. You can read, write, all that stuff, okay. So this is um, useful for, for getting my bearings with Rust, but I think this is not, um, not the most important part of understanding the LSP implementation per se. The push QRDX says the reason people compare it to Haskell is because is mostly because of some types, which is Rust and Ames, but also the drive macros. Yeah, um, I'm actually seeing like, I'm, I'm not sure, like we write down the features of a language, like. All languages are, are like Turing complete or whatever. Um, but what I'm seeing is um, a lot of similarities. I'm not sure if they would necessarily show up if you were like to make, if you're going to make the case that like uh, Rust and Haskell were, were similar. Um, uh, but I, I am seeing like um, similar behaviors as well. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the type system seems sim seem similar enough. And then Rust, uh, you know, Haskell is more about purity. Which is nice, and then I guess Rust is 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 more about being closer to um, closer to the metal, so you get like nicer, um, not like if you do C plus plus in a nice environment with with kind of like smart pointers and stuff, then there's a sense in which I think Rust feels a little bit like that, but um, Rust is like default safer, I would guess, whereas C plus plus is default like uh, unsafe. And um, I think Rust has the the benefit of being uh, being designed, I think, several decades later than, than than C plus plus, right? So they get to learn from from uh, from those things and kind of build build some of the niceness into the language. Rust seems to be a super popular language among people who who use it. Yeah. I think that that's true. That um, so so push QRDX is saying Haskell sacrifices performance for purity, but Rust doesn't. I I would maybe phrase that differently. I would say that um, there are there are benefits to to purity and there are benefits to performance. And it seems like the nicest thing would be if you could have Haskell and Rust like interrupt interrupt interoperate together. So like um, if you have a Haskell program. That needs to be super fast with a particular thing. It would be nice to um, to have like an, a Rust FFI, but I don't know if um, I don't know if there are technical obstructions to that sort of stuff. Rust language implementation for mostly Haskell. Oh, interesting. And CPP people. That's cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that there were Haskell people involved. I'm not surprised there are CPP people. Um, maybe I'll check out the <laughs> maybe I'll check out the the Rust. Uh, developer, um, wherever those de developers hang out. Um, all right, cool. So here's librs. This is a language server scaffold exposing a synchronous cross-beam channel-based API. This crate handles protocol handshaking and parsing messages while you control the message dispatch loop yourself. Okay, great. So um, here's connection. It's got sender and receiver. And the connection can do standard IO. Here's the question I had. So we're going to call standard IO, standard transport, and get three things back. But we are going to return two things, a connector, a, a connection of the first two things and IO threads. So I was right that the first two things get somehow looped, uh, uh, lumped together, but the way that they get lumped together is explicitly via a connection. So I thought maybe Rust was doing something fancy um, type-wise where you could assign 
one thing on the left to two things on the right, but that's that's not what's going on. Um, and then you can open a connection and whatnot. And then here's initialize start. Starts the initialization process by waiting for an initialized request from the client. Okay, so this does this does wait for a request. Um, use this for more advanced customization than initialize can provide. So initialize start. Uh, I guess takes just itself and it returns some sort of result. And we're going to call the receiver and see if we get something. And if it's um, an initialized request, respond to non initialized request with server not initialized. If we get an initialized request, we're going to return OK. Otherwise, we're going to return some sort of error. And if we get, maybe this means if, is this like the implementation of okay? No, this is, I think this is still part of the error handling. But where do we actually, so we match. And if we uh, get an initialized message, we, we return okay, but where do we actually use it? Is okay like an implementation thing? I'm not sure. All right, well, uh, I'll come back to that. So, and then here's initialize with, uh, this is what? Initialize the connection, sends the server capabilities to the client and returns the serialized client capabilities on success. So I guess the reason that they have this other version of initialize, so uh, you might ask, why not just initialize everything? Why wait for a message to, 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 for the client to ask the server to initialize? And I guess the reason is that we want to send the server capabilities to the client and then we want the client to return its capabilities on success. So um, this is kind of like a negotiation handshake thing, I guess, where um, you want to support different sorts of clients, which may be more or less capable. Um, and I think that that, that makes sense. So here's the function initialize. It's going to take some server capabilities, I guess, as an argument, and it's going to return uh, some result. And then we're going to call it initialize start and initialize data with some capabilities. And then we're going to call it initialize finished. And then there's some, something to handle shutdown. And um, So I guess initialize start is called uh, by the server itself. And, and then, yeah. We are waiting for a message here. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm missing a bunch of stuff. Uh, okay. So uh, push critics is telling us that if we uh, don't specify the destructors, they get ignored. So, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, um, Zusak. I'm glad that you were able to catch me. You, and you're asking me to look at the ZHS uh, source code. Yeah, sure. Um, would you, if you, if you want, if you wouldn't mind, uh, or you know what, I have a pen. Uh, it might be helpful if you also leave a comment uh, somewhere. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a note as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in Rust, the, 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 the last statement is implicitly returned. I think I understand that. What I don't understand is, um, <laughs> here's, what's, here's what's confusing me. We're gonna we're gonna loop and listen to some some messages, and then if we get an initialized one, we're calling OK with request ID and parameters. And is that a response? Is that sending a response? Return the request ID and serialized initialized params from the client. Returns. Yeah, so that is what we're returning. Okay, so this is the return value. 
And um, whoever is calling initialize, I thought that we were supposed to like send the client some stuff. So where are we calling initialize start? Okay, we're calling initialize start from initialize. Oh, okay, and then and then here we're getting the the uh, these parameters, um, and then we're I guess telling it the server uh, capabilities by calling initialize finish. Okay, so I think that what's going on is that these are like three functions. And one function handles the request that another function, um, uh, like kind of creates the response. And then the third find function like sends the response. So let's see if initialize fin finish sends the response, finishes this, the initialization process by sending. Yeah. Okay. So that's what's going, I was expecting the, uh, there to be like one thing that, that receives the request, does some stuff and sends a response, but they've broken it up into three functions and that, and that's why I was pretty confused. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so that's lib, and let's take a look at rec queue. So this should just be some queue. Uh, we've got some a hash map, I guess, and the request queue has an incoming and an outgoing, and they both, I guess, probably are, seem to be hash maps under the hood. And incoming, we can register, which takes whatever ID and data and inserts it. Now we can cancel. We can complete, uh, which removes, I guess, something. When we call re complete on a request, it removes it from the queue. And if completed, uh, it does that thing. And then, okay. So yeah, so this this directory um, is really just the, uh, the LSP server directory is really just the, uh, like setting up an R R uh, RPC service, a, J a JSON RPC service. So, where is the where's the logic that depends on where's the entry point I guess to to, to stuff that understands um, that understands the structure of rust and how is server capabilities used? These are in LSP types. Let's look at what else is going on in Rust Analyzer. We have LSP server. And we've got a bunch of, we've got crates. I don't know if crates is, is where we want to be. We've got lib. Um, I'm not going to go too much longer. I'm trying to keep these a little bit on the shorter side. I think that's what people, do people want, <laughs> do people want longer videos? Or uh, or shorter videos. So I was doing some that were, that were getting like two and a half hours, three hours, um, and I feel like that's that's harder to jump into. I feel like it might be better for um, for some things to just do multiple videos where like I come back in a bit with a fresh perspective. Um, but let me know if if people have a strong preference. So. Somewhere, uh, somewhere is going to be the code that does more of the, of, of, actually figuring out what, so, so what should, there should be like code that, that like, to, like, like tokenizes, uh, the file, um, that, uh, that understands the symbols and keeps probably some sort of table. And, um, when it receives a quest request looks up something in the table and so forth. And so I'm going to guess that um, all of that stuff is in uh, Rust Analyzer, unless Rust Analyzer is just calling out to the Rust compiler um, for everything. Um, we've got editor's code. I don't think that's what we want. AST inspector. But it's a TS file. Is TS TypeScript? This seems to be something other than Rust. 
the compiler that it implements what an LSP is what it does. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Uh, I would just, I I would still kind of expect some of the um, I would still expect some of uh, yeah. So the compiler should be in charge of of doing things like tokenizing, creating a symbol table. Um, but there should be some somewhere we should see that it it, it like talks to the compiler, right? And um, uh, I I would guess that like a lot of compiler doesn't need to do everything with like an AST. So I would be a little bit I, I'm expecting a little bit the um, this project should have other manipulations of the AST that that may that you may not need for compiling but you might need for something more like static analysis and it may be that all of that stuff is just pushed into the compiler with with more modern compilers so here's syntax source ast and parsing and validation this is starting to look more promising algo ast uh and we're getting a similar thing with with uh with haskell which is where we have um what's i'm going to guess is an entry point file and then a folder kind of backing up that entry point. So let me start by opening these, these files. Just a few of these that, that seem like they might be doing more compile stuff. Uh, maybe pointer. You want pointer? Hacks. I'll try libs in, in validation. And I'll just try to get a sense of what's going on here. Abstract syntax tree layered on top of untyped syntax nodes. Yeah, this does seem to be an abstract syntax tree. So let's see how big is this. And we have these test things, which I think must be a Rust thing. Rust tests in the same file. Did unit tests really be put in the same file as the source? The average lines of code per file in my project is pretty high. Yes, it doesn't have to be an inline module. You can still make a submodule that is a separate file. Okay, seems like Rust puts tests in the same file. That is interesting. Seems good. Seems better than having, um, like, what is it? I think Java does this thing where, like, your tests are not only in another directory, but because of the way that um, Java directories work, um, you, <laughs> it's like, it's like 14 directories away because you have to like go all the way back to the root and then go to like, you know, test slash com dot whatever. Um, and, uh, it's much nicer to have tests in my opinion, in my experience to have tests and source code in the same directory. And then Rust is, is stepping it up a notch by putting them in the same actual file, which is cool. I don't know which way I prefer. I mean, uh, it's pretty clear what a test is, but maybe if you're scrolling through, it's hard to, to ignore the tests or it's hard to just look at the tests. So I might prefer same directory, different files, but my mind is open. Okay, so uh, whatever mod support is, you've got a bunch of stuff like child, children, token. These are AST things, AST children, AST node, syntax kind. Yeah, this is... Um, Here's an AST node, which has got presumably L and R are left and right. So this is a tree. Um, it's in either L or R. So I don't know why you cannot have both L and R. And you can check whether you can cast it into a kind of syntax, I guess. Whether, uh, yeah. And then you can actually cast it and you get an optional. So I guess that can fail. And then. You can call syntax on yourself and get a syntax node back, which calls self as ref, I guess, like as a reference, and then either L syntax or R syntax. All right, so this is a, this is totally AST stuff. Um, in the spirit of like, uh, what are we doing here? Um, I guess for something for something like Rust, where I don't really understand what's going on, my 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 personal goal is more to just figure out where things are um, so that on a second pass, I would, you know, I, I'm more oriented. So I don't think it's, it's that 
essential to like dig into the AST implementation, especially since we've seen um, a bunch of AST like stuff. But I was feeling a little bit disoriented, not seeing anything <laughs> that looked like it was it was uh, working with an AST. And this is about as explicit as you get. Um, but I mean, maybe we can like look at things like the sorts of things that it does. Um, you know, is it doing anything especially interesting or different from what you would see in other stuff? Um, but yeah, we've got operators, tokens, et cetera, traits. Okay, cool. And what is algo? Um, returns, so this is ancestors at offset, returns ancestors of the node at the offset sorted by length. You're going to return your parents and your parents' parents', so your ancestors. Um, we can find a node at offset. So this we've seen a, a, a few files like this in different things. These are like um, all of the tree methods. So I guess that's why they call it algo, like tree algorithms. Um, these seem to just be are these implementations? Find node at offset is just going to call out the ancestors at offset. Find a node of a specific AST type at offset. Note that this is slightly imprecise. If the cursor is strictly between two nodes of the desired type, as in uh, right here, I guess that's the cursor, then the shorter node will always will be silently preferred. Hmm. Okay. So the cursor. So there's some notion of a cursor, right? So this is for things like like uh, text editors, where there's like a literal visible cursor, and you can. Uh, I think this this repo has the ability to like look at the definition, or at least it did in the other. Something I clicked brought up a tooltip, um, and so uh, I'm not sure why it's a cursor instead of a range, but I guess it's a cursor. So if like you know, if I'm here. It won't let me set me the cursor there. But if I if I have a cursor, like if I'm typing this symbol, I can look it out, look it up um, without having to select the whole symbol. So that's that's probably why it's a cursor and not a, a, a range. Yeah, here's something I can look up. This is the definition. Pub skip trivia token. This is the definition. Okay. There's no other definition to go to. That makes sense. Skip to the next non-trivia token. I don't know what it means, but, but trivia, but is it Maybe trivial is trivia. Let's let's jump to definition. Syntax kind is trivia, whether it matches white space or comment. Okay, I would call this trivial. Um, that's not a that's not a um, huge distinction. Just a, a point about uh, um, <laughs> I just read readability. I'm just you know when I when I read something and I'm not quite sure what it is. I'm just. Um, just trying to to verbalize this a little bit. So if it's if it's white space or a comment, is this is considered trivial? Um, what other syntax kinds do we have? Can we jump to syntax kind? Define syntax kind: a fieldless enum of all possible syntactic constructs of the Rust language. But it doesn't really have much here. From uh, for syntax kind. Parser. Am I missing something? Syntax, maybe it's in the folder. Generated. Ah, so we have a generated file, and it's a noom of all of the um, all of the uh, syntaxy stuff you can have. You can have a tombstone. I'm not sure what that means here, but you know, in databases, a tombstone is like a uh, something you explicitly enter into a database to uh, to indicate that that entry is dead, rather than doing something like deleting a deleting the line. Um, end of file, semicolon. So these are these are syntactic stuff. This is we're not yet we don't yet have symbols. We have like parts of symbols. Um, caret, percent, not equals to. Okay, so not equals to should be multiple symbols. Thin arrow should be multiple symbols. Presumably a dash followed by a. Um, that thing a dash followed by a uh, greater than sign. So some of these, some of these are, I guess, um, multiple, multiple characters. We have things like macro type, tuple type, a source file. I guess it can be its own thing. A shebang. Um, yeah, tuple field list lifetime. I guess maybe some sort of lifetime annotation, or like a pointer or some data. Um, self param. Maybe this is the kind of we we saw 
things taking themselves as arguments, which is kind of like a Python influence thing, it seems like. So maybe that's what self param is. Okay, so these are different kinds of syntax. Record expression. What about like a function? Function keyword, maybe? For keyword. Uh, uh, Fn might be the function itself. Return type. Okay, so these are these are symbols, I think. And not just like tokens or... or these can be multiple characters wide is, is what I'm trying to say. All right. Um, so what else do we have? So we have implementations. You can check whether it's a keyword, which is just going to look in this big list of things uh, of keywords. You would think that some, some people implementing this is keyword would just take this as a string and see whether it ends, it ends in underscore KW. Um, but this is probably the right implementation. Assuming the compiler will optimize in a way anything that looks... Um, inefficient. Um, you can check whether something is punctuation, like a parenthesis or curly brace. A fat arrow is considered punctuation. A pipe is considered punctuation. Okay, you can check, check whether something's illiteral. A literal, like a number, a float, a car, byte, string, etc. Okay. And from keyword, you can put in the keyword in in as like a string, and you get the corresponding keyword syntax kind thingy and from car and it's just a map from the character to its thing i wonder if we have the inverse maps i don't i don't see inverse maps here but you might you know be curious how to take a percent the the symbol percent and turn it into this percent character i don't know if that's done here or if there's a way to invert this map or whatever All right, cool. Here's lib. I don't know what lib is doing. Syntax tree library used throughout Rust Analyzer. Properties, easy and fast incremental reparsing. That's good. Graceful handling of errors, full fidelity representation. Any text can be precisely represented as a syntax tree. All right. So we've got some parse stuff in, in syntax news. Okay. We've got incremental reparse. I don't know if it tells us what kind of tree it is. What is this about source files? With I guess implementation source file means with a source file, which represents a parse tree for a single Rust file, you can parse it, and that's all. It has one a single function in this implementation. Okay. All right. So this is all cool stuff. I'm curious about validation. This module implements syntax validation that the parser doesn't handle. A failed validation admits a diagnostic. So this is going to, I guess, now that once we have syntax, um, the syntax par the, the parser is going to like fail on unparsable um, syntax, I guess. And the validator is, you know, once you have something that's that's capable of being parsed correctly, we're going to check whether it's valid Rust. So. So we have this single function validate, which is going to take a syntax node, presumably the root of a tree. Fix me an unescaped validation of raw string literals and raw byte string literals, or add on add, add unescaped validation, and then add validation of doc comments are being attached to nodes. So I guess you want to make sure that doc comments are attached to nodes. Is that what it's saying? Okay. So when we call validate, what happens? We give it the, this root, I assume. Uh, oh, it's actually called root. <laughs> yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, and then we're going to uh, iterate over its descendants in this for loop. And we're going to match, it, call this match AST macro. And inside of that, I guess we're going to call match node. And if it's a literal, we're going to validate literal. So this is kind of dispatch. If it's, a, if it's visibility, we're just calling out to these other implementations of validate stuff. Um, let's look at validate literal. Fix me. Move this function to outer scope. Okay. So we're going to, I guess, first unquote and then get a token, maybe a single token and some text. Fix me. Lift this lambda refactor to function, I guess. And it's linking out to different bugs. Um, I'm going to try to get a mutable push error by this lambda thing. Now that I know that this is Lambda. With a prefix length, I guess offset and error. 
and we're going to try to take the token text range start plus token plus text size try from. Okay, so we're going to try to just get the offset by doing this computation. And then whatever ACK is, we're going to push syntax error new at offset. Maybe ACK is accumulator. Are we passing in an accumulator to everything? Errors. So we're accumulating, I guess, errors. Okay. This doesn't seem to condition, conditionally be entered. So maybe it always tries to do this. Um, at any rate, we're going to try to match. We're going to do some sort of matching operation on kind. And if it's a string, we'll uh, check if it's raw. And uh, try to un unquote it and try to escape and such. And then we have different um, implementations for car. Oh, I guess that what this in, what is what was I confused by here? I think this is maybe doing an operation as a side effect, or maybe not. I have no idea. But here, this seems to be doing kind of like this operation as a as a side effect. We're going to unquote, and if we get an error, we're going to um, push the error. I guess, and if we don't get an error, then then we do nothing, and we've we've unquoted successfully, and maybe that's all we were checking for. We can validate block structure, which is going to take a root, uh, has some sort of stack. We're going to iterate over the descendants with tokens. And I, this must be a switch statement. This match thing that I keep seeing. Look up Rust switch statements. Yeah, match seems to be switch statements. Okay. Um, all right. So, and then we are somehow switching on kind. I don't know. I have no idea what this thing is. This is, I guess, apply the macro T. I don't know what the square brackets is, but something about curly braces. And if we get a left curly brace, we're going to push a node. So this is the beginning of some sort of block. If we get a, a right curly brace, we are going to pop some stuff off the stack and check that some things are equal. I, we, what we must be doing is looking for the corresponding left curly brace, right? Um, and are we just, I think we're just popping curly braces on the stack, not like anything inside of it. And so when we pop, we should expect to see a left curly brace. And if we don't, then we essentially have like two, yeah, we have some sort of unpaired uh, curly brace situation and, and we error out, it looks like. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So now we know where that stuff is. Okay, so what have we seen? We've seen um, we've seen the server side uh, where you get messages and you send messages. We've seen where uh, some of the logic where it parses and validates and builds up an AST. Um, what we haven't seen, I think, is uh, kind of where the messages, uh, the LSP messages, are turned into um, actual like commands. Or, or functions that are executed on the on the um, abstract syntax tree. So, like if you call go to definition, it should perform some sort of, sort of lookup, presumably. And so, I wonder if we can find that. Maybe IDE DB. I don't know what HIR is. In HIR, we get things like semantics and source analyzers and symbols. That looks promising. Has source from ID and DB. I'm going to guess this, this might be what I was looking for. I'm not positive. We use IDE DB as a folder. And we get assists, defs. Let's look in defs. Famous devs. <laughs> All right, we'll go. Items locator. This looks even more promising. Label, lib, line index, 
path transform rename symbol index that's about as promising as you can get and we'll i think we'll stop there i'm going to guess that this is going to um kind of give us that that last bridge that i was looking for where we go from requests on the one side uh, abstract syntax tree on the other and somehow in the middle we've got um, we kind of need to pipe the requests to something going on in the tree. So and what's an IDE? We have things like annotations. All right, hover, typing, go to definition. Okay, so these are going to be the... Um, inlay hints. Yeah, so we'll, we'll look at these two. This is even more. Um, this is even more closer to the IDE world, I think. And this is probably just going to call out to some of the stuff that we see in syntax, maybe, and in, in whatever the the IDE DB thing is. We've got syntax tree and typing. So we'll, we'll look at just a few of these: matching brace, markup, markdown, remove, join lines, inlay hints, hover. So this stuff is, is I think, all going to be pretty interesting. Um, if you're, if you're interested in the UI side of things. Okay. So here's HIR source symbols per field. What is, um, is HIR a thing? Maybe it's an LSP thing. HIR. Scalable HIR architecture. Human interface something. So the HIR of the function. Maybe it's a rest thing. High level IR, high level intermediate representation. Okay, so this is some high level intermediate representation, um, compilery stuff, and we have symbols. So what do we have? So we have things like file symbol, the actual data that's stored in the index. It should be as compact as possible. We have declaration location, which has a, a field for the uh, ID, file ID, a syntax node pointer that points to the whole syntax node of the declaration. And then we have a thing, a syntax node pointer that reports that, that points to the identifier of the declaration. The whole syntax node. This, I guess, the second thing is just a name. And the first thing is really like a subtree, I, I guess. Um, we have a declaration location, which has, uh, you can call the function syntax. I guess returns the the syntax node. These are, I guess, kind of like getters. You can call original uh, original range, which will return the file range, and original name range. You can resolve a node given an HIR database and a file ID, and then we're going to take the database and, and either parse or expand it from the file. I guess probably look at the file, inflate some stuff, and then get a pointer to the the node somehow. Oh, no, no, this is the pointer. We're going to get take the pointer, turn it into a node, and then um, some in file new file ID node. I guess in file is, is somehow going to resolve, try to resolve it. We have file symbol kinds, const, enum, function, macro, module. I don't know why these are file symbols, um, but that's what they're called. And we've got a symbol collector. Given a module ID and a here database, use the def map for the modules crate to collect all symbols that should be indexed for the given module. Okay, okay. So we've got some sort of def map, maybe a definition map uh, from the modules crate. And that's going to tell us what we should index. So the, the collect thingy is going to take a here database, her database, um, and a module. And it just seems like we're calling like a like a constructor.
And there's some stuff about initial work. The initial work is the root module we're collecting. Additional work will be populated as we traverse the module's definitions. All right, cool. And then we have do work, um, which we're going to try to, I guess, unwind the database if we're canceled. We're going to look at the work parent. I guess do the work of the parent, maybe, and then uh, something def with body ID name on the ID and self with container name collect from module. Collect from module. It's going to take a module ID and self. And it's going to get the def map. So somehow, when, when this is called, we've already got a def map, which seems to be the list of things we're supposed to index. So I don't know where the def map comes from. Um, maybe that's ultimately from the compiler. Maybe that's something that's implemented here in uh, Rust Analyzer. But we're not going to dig too deep. I think I've, we have a sense of what, <laughs> where this stuff is now. So uh, we'll move along. Here's uh, source analyzers. Rust. Look up HIR elements using positions in the source code. This is a lossy transformation. In general, a single source might correspond to several modules, functions, etc., due to macros, CFGs, and whatever this thing star uh, hash path equals attributes on modules. So this module should not be used during HIR construction. It exists purely for IDE needs. Okay, so uh, this is somehow. Source Analyzer is a convenience wrapper which exposes the HIR API in terms of the original source files. It should not be used inside the HIR itself. So this is some kind of translation layer from the HIR land, uh, which is has all of the data to data that's kind of presented more for the IDE. And somehow in the process of presenting it more for the IDE, we lose information is, is I think what it's saying. I'm actually going to close out all the HIR stuff. I feel like I have a sense of um, of what's going on there, and I want to get to the other stuff. Here's, uh, maybe we'll look at DBs. Re-exports various subgrades databases so that the calling code can depend only on HIR. This breaks abstraction boundary a bit, but it would be cool, if, and it would be cool if we didn't do it. We need this for at least LRU caching at the query level. Okay. I'm not sure if the okay. Let's see if like Rust HIR database. That might be something from the compiler. I'm not sure. I'm gonna guess it is. That's kind of how I think we saw Haskell work. Here's IDE DB. Uh, defs name definition keeps information about the element we want to search references for. The element is represented by name kind. It's located inside some container and has a visibility, which defines a search scope. Okay. So we've got a container and something that's telling us about what scope to search in. Note that the reference search is possible for not all of the classified items. And we import a bunch of stuff from HIR, the, the high some high inter intermediate representation or something like that. Um, and then this def this is called definitions, but they're saying maybe it's better called symbol. And this includes things like macros, fields, modules, functions, ADT, abstract something else tree, definition tree, type alias, generic param, local label. Seems like HR is the symbol table stored in heap. Okay. Yeah, that that um that makes sense. There was this stuff about databases. I'm not sure where the database is stored. Uh, heap would be a good guess. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't think I, I don't think I explicitly made that connection. But yeah, so this so um this is <laughs> this is the thing that that I was saying it was calling the symbol table. We're doing some sort of lookup in it. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, whatever definition, we've got some canonical module path with a root database. And I guess we're going to get the canonical module path. Create with a K. Maybe it's because create with a C can't be used. Um, and we can, I guess, given a root database, we can ask about visibility of self. I guess I can ask, I can ask whether I am visible. And what is it? Some of these things are SF and some of them are it. 
maybe that's just um maybe the, the the name maybe this is just a captured or um a dummy parameter or something but it's checking whether things are visible we can ask for names okay so this is cool we can classify a token we can classify lifetimes and how are we doing that we're just calling name ref class classify lifetime i don't know where name ref class is let's see if it's in this file Okay. Here, here's maybe one implementation of classify lifetime is going to take some semantics and the semantics, I guess, has some sort of reference to a root database and it's got a lifetime and whatever profile span is classify lifetime detail lifetime to string. I guess we're just peeking inside of something and, and getting it, getting what it thinks its lifetime is. And then we're going to get the parent by calling syntax parent. And if we get something, um, then we'll try to cast, we'll try to clone its parent, then cast it as like a lifetime param. And then maybe, uh, convert it to a definition and map it <laughs> into something. Otherwise, uh, we'll just try to convert it to definition. Yeah, so it seems like ultimately this is just a lookup. So classify lifetime isn't like um, doing any fancy inference algorithmically. It's just kind of like peeking at something and, and doing all of the juggling of, of types and figuring out where things are. Um, so Abhishek, what do you mean by um, when you say it would be the unwrapped value? Oh, it would be the unwrapped. Oh, okay. So the, uh, when I, I think this is probably something you typed when I was looking at the, um, uh, the, the SF versus it stuff. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Here's famous depths, which I opened just cause it had an interesting name. Allow non snake case famous depths helps with finding well-known things inside the standard library. This is somewhat similar to the known paths infra inside HIR, but uh, is different. We want to make sure that the IDE specific paths don't become interesting inside the compiler itself as well. The IDE specific paths don't become interesting inside the compiler as well. Okay. Note that by default, Rust analyzer tests do not include core or standard libraries. If you're writing tests or functionality using famous devs, you'd want to include multi-core declarations at the start of your tests. Okay. So what are the famous things? Things like uh, standard, alloc, core, test, proc, macro, and some convert things, some uh, iterator. I guess these uh, copy, these are, I guess, things that are commonly used. And uh, I'm not sure really what it's doing, but maybe it's like hard, uh, hard coding these things so they don't have to be looked up. I'm not sure. Um, we have items locator in create IDE DB slash source. So we're going to search the project and its dependencies for a certain item by its name and a few criteria. The main reason for this module to exist is the fact that the project's items and dependencies items are located in different caches with different APIs. Okay. I'm glad that they told us that because, um, now I, now I'm going to just assume that this file, um, has a few different caches and APIs and is just calling the right thing to look up the right thing. So, um, HIR might be one. We have a sock item search and include exclude uh, a sock items only search for the name in both associated and other items search only in other items or search for the name in the associated items only. Okay. And this function items with names. Searches for importable items with the given name in the crate and its dependencies. So this must be a function that's called all the time, I would imagine. So it's going to take some semantics, a crate, uh, the name to import, the, uh, the uh, this whatever this configuration for how to search, I guess, and a limit, uh, maybe the number of things to find. Okay. So. 
I still don't know what profile span is, but we're going to get, we're going to call it, um, and I guess format it. Maybe this is to create like a, a structure or, or some, or some sort of like JSON like thing, whatever. Um, and then we have, uh, this let thing with a mutable local query and an external query. And we're going to switch on name. Name to import exact, exact name, case sensitive. So I guess whether, I don't know if exact name is the exact name or whether it needs to be exact name, and maybe this is whether the, the search is case sensitive or something. And then we're going to, uh, we have a simple index query and an import map query. So these are the two caches, I guess. One is a symbol index and one is the import map. And I will check if it's case sensitive. And is this like returning the, uh, oh, okay. So we're gonna, I guess, return the local query. And then if it's case sensitive, um, we're gonna return the, this version of the external query. Otherwise we're gonna return this version of the external query. And then there's some, I guess, fuzzy matching for, for names to import. And then we have, we, we're going to limit some stuff by limiting whatever we got from the external query and from the local query. And then we're going to call find items and then find items is going to actually do the finding presumably. I'm going to look up some crate symbols. It's going to query external importables given a database and whatever external importables chain is. And then we're going to filter, I guess, out things that, that we don't want based on what was passed in. Here's get name definition. And get name definition, this seems to be just a string, whatever underscore P is, seems to be kind of like a stringy type thing. Um, a candidate node is going to be set to import candidate, uh, location syntax at semantics, I guess, and this might fail or succeed. And then if we, I guess if we succeeded and if, and if the kind is name, then we'll do some stuff. We'll look in the children to try to find that name. Otherwise, I guess maybe this is just return statement. Otherwise we'll just return candidate node. Oh, okay. So if candidate node is not a name, then we'll, oh, I see. So uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll get the candidate node. Um, and if it's not a name, then it's some other thing and it has children, I guess. And those children might have the correct name. Otherwise we, we just return the candidate node. And then, um, we try to cast the candidate node name to some AST name thing, I, I guess. And we try to, and we call name classify on it and check whether it's defined. All right. So those are, we're starting to see some of the search functionality. Uh, I'm not sure we're starting to necessarily understand it or, or appreciate the, the nuances, but we're starting to at least see, uh, where it is. It looks like, I think it spans, oh, it spans is for the telemetry. Yeah. Oh, that would make sense. Thank you, Yuri. Oh, whoops. Okay, here's line index. Line index maps flat text size offsets into line column. Okay, I think we can mostly ignore that. Uh, that might be interesting, but we've been here for a while, I guess. Path transformer. Path transform substitutes path in syntax nodes in bulk. This is mostly useful for IDE code generation. If you paste some existing code into a new context, for example, to add method overrides to an implementation block, you generally want to appropriately qualify the names and sometimes you might want to substitute generic parameters as well. So I guess this is the example. If you have mod X, um, I'm not sure something about, uh, if you paste in code, renaming things appropriately in, uh, with paths. So, um, I think we can ignore, ignore that safely. Here's a module to handle uh, fuzzy searching of functions, structs, and other symbols by name across the whole workspace and dependencies. It works. 
by building an incrementally updated text to search index of all symbols. The backbone of the index is the awesome SFT or FST crate created by at burnt sushi. All right, so this is really just calling out the, whatever FST is, but we'll look up um, what, what this crate is. FST is a library for efficiently storing and searching ordered sets or maps where the keys are byte strings. The key design goal of this crate is to support storing and searching very large sets or maps that, uh, that is billions. This means that much effort has gone into making sure that all operations are memory efficient. Sets and maps are represented by a finite state machine, interesting, which acts as a form of compression on common prefixes and suffixes in the keys. Additionally, finite state machines can be efficiently queried with automata like regular expressions or Levenstein distance for fuzzy queries or lexicographic ranges. Read more about the mechanics of finite state transducers, including a bibliography for algorithms used in this crate through the docs. How does it work? Cool. Well, I'll read this later. Um, some sort of fast thing. I was expecting it to be a tree thing, and uh, it seems to be um, uh, about finite state automata. That doesn't mean it's that is not some sort of fast tree lookup thing. You, you, you might be able to write down a proof that they're equivalent in some sense, but um, I don't think I've run across this particular sort of thing before. Um, and that is cool, but um, I think we can mostly skip this file uh, because it's going to be just calling out to that crate, building up queries. Um, and this is, this is important to to uh, the language server but um i just kind of see what else is there rather than digging in deeper into, into anything that's that that's rather than doing a deep dive in, into something additional and technical um here is a go to definition which should be the implementation of go to definition so navigate to the definition of an identifier or outline module this will navigate to the source file of the module okay So go to definition is going to take a root database and a file position. And it's going to create new semantics from the database. Maybe database is like, um, we'll see if we can find, will we? Maybe we won't. Maybe root database is, is kind of like a serialization of whatever the, the semantics tree is. That, that's going to be my guess. It may not have to be written to file. It might be written to file, or it might be just a memory representation in some, in some kind of buffer or something. Um, and then we have original token, which we're going to get by calling pick the best token, given the offset. And I guess it's, let's see. And the token can be ident, int number, lifetime, ident, et cetera. And we have a bunch of T stuff, the, uh, T macro stuff, index and prefix ops. Um, all right. And then. We'll try to get token as dot comment. I guess try to make it into dot comment, and that might succeed. In which case, we'll return some dot comment stuff. Otherwise, we're gonna uh, take the semantics. We're gonna descend into macros, and then I guess maybe convert whatever we get into an iterator, and then filter some stuff, taking it, giving it a lambda that that, that takes a token, looks at its parent, tries to cast its parent as a token tree. And then try to look up include paths. So we'll, I guess given the token, we'll try to look up some include information, given the, the semantics, the token tree, and uh, was token passed in? No. Token was uh, maybe... Where's token from? Token is this... We're mapping... Token is the thing we're mapping over um, in the position file ID. And if we get a re if we get something sensible back, we're going to return it. I guess kind of wrapped in a vector. And if we don't return there. We're going to do whatever this is. We're going to try to classify the token, and collect some stuff, and then flatten. Take the unique elements, presumably, and then collect them again. I guess into a vector of navigation targets, and return. Uh, the navs and return those navigation targets by turning them into ranges. 
somehow. Yeah. Cool. You just try to look up include path. I guess I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, this is an interesting file. I think this is worth, uh, you know, if you're interested in uh, the Rust LSP stuff, that's a, a good file um, to, to really look closely at the implementation of a particular feature. And then you can kind of trace out where it goes if you're if you're interested in um, in having like a the, the lifetime of like a query as it go as it flows into the system and, and like where it goes. I think that would be a good a good entry point for that sort of thing. Here's hover. I'm just expecting it to be support for like yeah, like like tool tips that happen when you hover over stuff. Um, it has some hover config links and hover documentation keywords format. Um, hover action something runnable whatever implementation is, a reference, or go to type. Okay, so this is just an enum. And uh, yeah, feature hover shows additional information like the type of an expression or the documentation for a definition when focusing code. Focusing is usually hovering with a mouse like that, but it can also be triggered with a shortcut. Okay, hovering with a mouse, I guess just means hovering, hovering, okay. Yeah, and I assume it's the the um. So this is the, this is the server, right? So I guess it's the IDE's job to let the server know when something's being hovered. So you should get some sort of hover query, I would, I would assume. Okay, and we have inlay hints. I don't know render colons discriminant hints parameter hints. I guess these are uh, um, suggestions, like code suggestions. Hide name constructor hints. And these are just um, like, uh, you know, hard coded here, lifetime elision hints. Um, so I guess these are all the types of hints you can have, closure style. This is starting to look more like um, maybe linting. Uh, often with linters, you see, um, see like a configuration. Uh, there should be some way to get, like configure uh, this sort of stuff. Um, but maybe this is like the complete universe of, of hints that are supported. I don't know if this is from LSP or if this is um, Rust specific. Um, and then these are, you get different enums for the different kinds. So for like, uh, let's see, lifetime elision hints. You can, the enums are always skip trivial and never. And for inlay kind hints, we have binding mode, chaining, closing brace, closure return type, et cetera. Okay, so an inlay hint has a text range, an inlay kind, an inlay hint label, and a text edit, an option. The edit to apply when accepting this inlay hint. Okay, so this is, you're like hovering over something or whatever, and it's like, oh, you know what? You can do this in a less silly way, and then you get like apply or ignore or whatever. And then if you click apply, I guess the function that's, um, that's executed is this thing, which returns an optional text edit. I'm kind of curious what a text edit does, but it must essentially be a diff that you apply to a range. And I'm not going to go searching <laughs> for its implementation. Um, let's see. So here's the syntax tree in IDE source, which I think we're just going to ignore. We've seen lots of syntax trees. So show syntax tree. So this is just going to show the syntax tree. Shows the parse tree of the current file. It exists mostly for debugging, specifically for debugging Rust Analyzer. Cool. And then typing. This module handles. Auto magic editing actions applied together with user's edits. For example, if the user typed text foo dot bar dot bass and the cursor is here and types dot, next we want to indent the dot. Language server executes such typing assists synchronously. That is, they block users typing and should be pretty fast for this reason. Okay. So are you sending, I'm not sure if you're sending like every keystroke. I guess we could look at the um, the language server protocol uh, definition or or a spec specification. Um, let's just see. Uh, if, here's the typing assist maybe entry point on character types. Yeah, I guess you do get a uh, character. So you're gonna on character type typed. You're gonna get a root database, a file position, the character, and an option source change. And it's whatever something about this trigger cars, and then we're gonna parse the DB into a file. 
on every character typed. So I guess this must be fast. Um, and didn't they say it was blocking? So we're not like parsing the DB in the background. Am I understanding this correctly? We are parsing it. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're parsing it synchronously. Is that right? And then um, the edit is going to be on character typed inner. So some we're going to do some inner function, and uh, we might get a source change from text edit. So we're going to take a text edit and, and maybe get a source change object. Um, we'll check if it's a snippet. And if so, set source change is snippet to whatever edit is snippet is. And we're going to return some source change. Hmm. And here's on character typed inner. And here we have this uh, essentially a switch statement. If it's a dot, or we'll call on dot type. So this is basically dispatch. Okay. It's async as far as I know. Things to do if you want to master a lot of programming. That's a good question, Daniel. Let me um, let me get that. Let me answer that. I guess after I um, after I close this out. Let's see. Language server executes such typing assist synchronously. That is, they block the user's typing. So it's possible. Um, so Yuri is telling me that they think it's asynchronous. So it's possible that on car typed is is asynchronous, but the um, And, and maybe you could argue that the thing that's synchronous is whatever, uh, like on dot typed. Let's see, let's see if we can go to the definition of on dot typed. Um, but I don't know how that would be the case because if the outer function is asynchronous, then I don't know how you're going to get a synchronous function. So let's look this up um, in uh, LSP uh, specification. And maybe. Maybe on car type is from the specification. I'm not sure. Looks promising. Overview of message ordering, basic structures, lifecycle message, document synchronization, base protocol, right? Header part, content part. Request. Let's let's just try a web service to see if it executes on every character type. LSP is throwing an error on each and every character I type. Um, how does LSP work? The client opens the file and sends text document it did open to the server. The server analyzes the file and sends the blah, blah, blah. The client parses the results and displays error indicators in the editor. Yeah. Somewhere I read a, I read a specification that um, seemed more easier to navigate than this. <clears throat> Let me see if I can... Um, so these are like header, these are like message headers. Then we have contents. Then we have structures. Maybe I want here overview capabilities. Here's a hover request. What about list of all LSP message? Requests. This is the thing I was just looking at. Progress. The base protocol also offers also support for report progress in a generic fashion. Fashion. Did I already try looking up character? Maybe chat GPT is the thing to ask. Let me try Google.
Let me try does, um, yeah, does LSB execute every character type? Did I already try Google for this? Um, all right, so search engines are not giving me a, a great answer. Let's try chat GPT. Does language server protocol? Send a message on every character typed. Okay, chat GPT. Let's try Bard. Is Bard still around? Uh, so Bard tells me, no. The language server protocol does not send a message on every character typed. LSP is a protocol. Yeah. LSP messages are sent when the language client needs to communicate with the language server. Okay. This can happen when the language client wants to request a feature provide information or receive information. The messages are not sent for every character typed. This would be inefficient and would cause a lot of unnecessary traffic. Yeah, that's right. Instead, LSP messages are typically sent when the language client performs an action, such as pressing a key. <laughs> but pressing a key is the same thing, right? As typing a character. For example, when the client presses enter key, it sends an LSP message to the language server to request that the language server execute the current line of code. The language server then executes the code, and then an LSB message back to the language client with the results. That, that, that doesn't sound quite right, but maybe that's right. Let me try just refreshing uh, ChatGPT or something. So ChatGPT is telling me the same thing. Wait, is this literally the same response? Oh. Okay. LSP is a protocol for communication between language client and language server. What did they say? The client server protocol used for language services such as code completion. Okay, no, they're similar, but um, when the user types a character, the ID editor sends the updated content to the language server. This is saying when I type a character, the editor is sending the updated content to the language server. However, some LSP clients may have a delayed typing feature where the client waits for a short period after the user has stopped typing before sending the updated content to the server. Okay, so I'll ask a follow-up question. So does the client send uh, updates on every character typed? It depends on the client implementation, but, but typically the client does not send updates on every character. Instead of may we for, okay, so this, this is more about the delay. So, uh, maybe this is homework. We can figure out, um, like what, what is commonly the case? Because if you want, you know, if you do something like searching, uh, if you have like search suggestions enabled, then, um, you know, each type you, each time you type a character, uh, let's see if we can do this in, 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 uh, Google. Yeah, so if I type in P, I was going to type potatoes, but, um, you know, so every every character I type in a search engine uh, goes over the internet and into the, uh, I don't know how far it goes, but I get some suggestions back that I think are, um, are not entirely tied to my, uh, my machine, right? This, this is probably going to some Google front end into some search suggestion things. And the fact that the first recommendation for, for P is pointers Rust, and I'm doing a, a Rust video, suggests that it's somehow keeping track of my context. But um, you know, every character I type, it, it's sending some information. So it might be if I type a bunch of characters at once, it doesn't send everything at once, it probably does some some chunking, and maybe that's what it's, maybe that's what the what, what chat G, the chat GPT and um, Bard are trying to tell me. But I suspect that like if you type like, int foo, like if you type kind of slow like that, it, it might send a character, uh, um, it may, might send things a character at a time. I'm not sure, I have I have no idea, but that's kind of the impression that I'm getting, um, it, it kind of based also on, on some of the other stuff I've seen with LSP. So if you happen to know, let me know. Um, 
I'll check the the chat now to make sure that I'm not missing somebody who who knows for sure. Um, so Evan says, I think it's the client's job to be async in the requests to not hang the UI. Okay, sure. Okay, so yeah, okay. The LSP doesn't know about the UI loop at all. That that's a good point. So what was this message? Um, I guess maybe synchronously means uh, in the context of the the client server protocol. So I I think. Evan, you're you're raising a really good point, which is that um, in the the UI thread, should asynchronously send the message to the the server, and I think that maybe what the comment in the Rust code was saying is that the server is going to synchronously send the message back. So it's not like um, the client sends a request to the server, and then gets a gets a call back, and then executes that call back when it's ready. So um, I think I think that's a, I think that's probably what happens. So the the UI asynchronously has the client send some stuff, but the client is is waiting for the server to respond rather than returning right away. And then push uh, push QRDX is saying a bunch of stuff. When you type the first character, you get a list of all completions. For instance, okay, and each character after that doesn't query the server, but instead filters your current candidate. Okay, so all right. That makes sense. So maybe the client keeps track of whether you're at the start of a new symbol or not. Um, but if you backspace, however, you trigger another server request. Okay. This is really informative. Is this something you, you just tried uh, push QRDX or is this something that um, that you happen to know already? Same goes for the so-called trigger uh, characters, like the dot operator, which always queries the server. Okay, so if you send a dot, you always send a, you always query, I guess. And that might be language dependent, I don't know. Depends on the client. So uh, uh, Abhishek is saying it depends on the client implementation. NeoVim has key bindings for most actions on save. Okay. And then there's, uh, so push QRDX is also saying, then there's a de debounce request, which is sent whenever you stop the writing to trigger checking for techniques. Okay, cool. This all makes sense. These are these are all um, totally reasonable uh, um, optimizations that, 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 that make sense. Um, All right, um, so that's it. I got a question here uh, that I said I would get back to. That was kind of a... Um, about development, I think. But yeah, so Daniel was, was asking things to do if I wanted to master a lot of programming. Uh, that's a good question, and it's it's broad, and I think it depends a lot on um, on where you are. But I, I, at the end of the day, I think the answer is to write a lot of programs. I probably read more stuff than the average programmer. Like there are some some programmers who um, really like doing like tutorials and and getting their hands dirty and like messing around with an application. Um, I do that as well. Um, but I find that, um, if, if that's the first thing I do, uh, and, and I see this also with some other developers, sometimes you get kind of like in, in tutorial mode and you understand, uh, like the t tutorial scope of a, of a tool you're using, but as soon as you're outside of that scope, um, things are much harder. And then, um, that can be a little bit hard to see if you have blind spots like that. So I think that that's, that's where reading helps. So, um, I don't have any, like, great advice other than uh write code that that interests you and um and and read like read books about uh the various things and there's a huge ton of just information online um but i think that with a lot of stuff like this there's a there's a lot to be said about um finding the stuff that that interests you cuz that's going to help you uh continue to work on something when, when, uh, when you might otherwise stop, right? So like if you're, if you're cleaning your garage and you're tired, then you're eventually just going to stop. But if you're working on a problem that's like obsessing your brain, <laughs> and then you just might go without sleep <laughs> for a few days. So like finding that sort of stuff kind of helps align um, your, your energy and the stuff you want to create with, with the world. So uh, I, I, Maybe I'll um, I'll put together some list of frequency frequently asked questions, 
because I feel I feel a little bit like um, I never have, you know, I never have quite the right the, the right thing to say, but but, I, but that's where I would start, um, and stuff like that. Okay, and I think that's about it. Oh, okay, so I, I'm getting okay. So push cure to the same that they feel with LSP a little bit before. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. It varies depending on the client, um, and they and they're also saying writing new things and reading existing code, although. Through trying to contribute open source, yeah, I think that I think that those are those are really good, um, and uh, if you um, maybe try both front end and back end stuff, there are some people who I think are are suited like really like the front end is maybe a little bit more exciting in my in my opinion in the sense that like you there's more you have to pay more attention to like what frameworks are out or whatever. Um, but with some backend stuff, like, like some C stuff, um, you can get really far, uh, with never checking out like what the new, the new and exciting stuff is. And so some people prefer one style or the other. So I guess I would try both styles, try functional styles and just figure out what you think is the most fun. Um, every so often you should check whether you're actually working on an employable skill um, but I wouldn't over optimize on that. I would kind of try to find, you know, what your niche is, um, and where you feel happy. And then once you know that you can try casting around to see, to see whether, um, you need to round out by, by working on some skill that that's more employable than what you found interesting or, or if you can push, push further with what you're doing. So just different things, different things to try. And with that, I think uh, I think we're done for the day. So um, that was a look at Rust, uh, the Rust LSP implementation. I learned a lot about <laughs> LSP. I learned a lot about Rust, um, and hopefully, um, some people also learned some stuff that they found interesting. The next LSP one we're we're doing is uh, next week. We're going to look at Haskell, and uh, since I'm slightly better at reading Haskell, and since we've looked at some a bunch of the compiler stuff. I think that that will be a nice way to see um, to see like very very clearly uh, how 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 their type system maps into the LSP stuff, and that'll be a good contrast to Rust. Um, and then I think the week after that we'll be looking at at Source Graph, which is going to be I guess the first kind of sophisticated Rust client rather than a server. Thanks. And uh, thanks for everyone who's watching. And uh, I hope, uh, <laughs> hope you had a good time. And I'll see you around. Oh, before I go. So I, I wish I could say, am I going to do a section on, on Geeks? I've done both Geeks and Nicks. Um, so you can find those videos on my, on my YouTube channel. Um, I, it might be worth revisiting them. Um, but I did at least an initial look through, um, through what those are, what they were up to. All right. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, bye.